Hi there, welcome back. What we're looking at here is probably the purest definition of a nightmare. This is a Griffin S100 power amplifier. If you don't know the uh, Griffin brand, it's a bloody nice piece of kit. Except this one has actually gone through the ringer in so many ways, it's unbelievable. Now the reason I'm doing this video is this is not a restoration, this is not a repair, this is a show and tell, this is an attempt. Um, I'm not even sure that this is going to work when I get to the end of it, but I thought I'd um, show you just how badly things can go wrong when someone messes with equipment and they don't know what they're doing. Now, the gentleman who owns this said that uh, he put it with a repairman who probably didn't do a good job because the result was really bad. And uh, I'll show you. First of all, let me show you what the amplifier really is. As you can see, it's been opened. I've done quite a bit of work on it. And I'll go through what I've done and what I still need to do. What you see here is the preamp board or the input board, control boards for the power amplifier. And... Um, it's got a balanced input for the left and a balanced input for the right or vice versa. And this board actually comes out quite easily because it's got all the connectors pretty easily accessible and removable. So I removed this board and I'll show you the board in a minute, but I'll show you a bit more of how this fits in the amp so you get an idea of what we're talking about. The power amplifier is uh, a dual, really it's a dual mono because it's completely separate one channel from the other. All it has in the front is an on-off switch, that thing over there. The reason that light's going on is that there's still a bit of charge in the capacitors in there, but it is disconnected from mains. There's nothing else on the front. When you switch it on, there are two LEDs that just tell you what's happening with the left and the right channel. Now these two are pretty much identical as you can see except at the front there's those two gaping holes and those holes are where the preamp board fits in. So I'm going to show you the one side and that'll be the same for the other one. The only thing that's different between the left and the right side is this section over here and all that is those are the uh, control relays the output protection relays it's got a separate power supply for that that little blue transformer and that really has very little to do with each of the the amplifiers so let's look at the amp itself this thing's got a massive massive power transformer it's steroidal the idea is to produce um, plus minus 70 volts with a lot of power behind it. That is rectified at the bottom there with those bridge rectifiers. And then it goes to the capacitor board. And as you can see, that's pretty substantial. So you should get some very, very good clean power out of this. That then feeds the amplifier, the, the output board, which is that one vertical over there. And that, in, that thing is driven by pairs of transistors, PNP and NPN. They are parallel, there are six pairs. You actually see seven at the top there, but the two front ones are the drivers. And then you have those uh, three wires there, the, the white, the green, and the brown, that bring the drive signal from the preamp board, the one I've shown you on the bench here, to the actual power board. Now, everything is pretty hefty and everything is very, very good quality. Everything. The brands of capacitors, the uh, banana uh, sockets, Everything is very, very well built in this thing. It's actually amazing what they've done here. Just as amazing as what somebody else has done trying to repair this thing. Now, other than a bit of dust, 
this output board seems pretty intact and when I got this thing I was told that the one side worked. Now I know that's not true because that connection over there and the side that worked I presume is this one. That connection over there, those three wires, the green, brown and white were actually swapped over. The green is a reference ground and then the brown is the driver plus and the white is the driver minus signal. And what they'd done is they'd put the, they'd uh, messed up the order of the wires. So the ground, the reference ground was actually connected to one of the inputs. So there's no way this thing worked. And just as well I didn't try it. I've now replaced those wires so that I test the, the channel that I've already worked on, which I'll show you, and we should get something positive out of that. Now on this side I've removed the power to the board and insulated it somewhat because the testing is going to be done on the other side and the idea is to get the one side working perfectly before I mess around with this side which is the one that seems to be a little bit more damaged on the preamp board anyway. There are also a few other things that are evident here. This is the way the wires were connected on there. You can actually see they've got the green wire in the middle. That's a reference ground. That's wrong as well. You can probably get an idea of the quality of soldering that went on there. It's a total, total mess. The other thing is that I've noticed, and it happened on the other one as well, the negative connector there is broken off. It's actually just broken off over there. So this thing is a long way from working, and it certainly was a long way from working when I received it. It starts getting really interesting when you look at the preamp or the input board, because that's where the damage happened. These things are two channels, left and right. This left channel I've actually worked on, and I'll get into that in a minute. The right channel I haven't touched. Now because this is really a dual mono system, with the exception of the, uh, the input switching and input plug, you can actually test one preamp with one power amp section. In fact, you can test this preamp with the other power amp section as well, because the connections are the same. And my guess, my guess, and I'm not sure of this, is that the problem is not on the output boards at all. The entire problem was actually on this board, um, with the one and the other channel probably both being damaged. In fact, I've found problems on this supposedly good channel as well. Not only the connections to the power board, as, you, as I've mentioned, but something else. But the damage went a bit further to the point where we had some pretty bad component changes. We've had some pretty burnt out resistors, as I'll show you. And this is why, as I said, I'm not sure that I'm going to actually get this thing working. But this is the challenge. and We'll see how far we can get. Now, it doesn't look so bad from here, right? It doesn't. But let me show you a bit closer on the top of the board and then I'll show you the reverse side. Here's a first peek at some of the components that have been messed up here. You've got a burnt resistor over there, there's a diode, that resistor seen better days, that one is charred to a crisp, so is that one. That one may be alive, diode and a resistor obviously also been changed. Now he told me that every time they swapped out components this worked for a second and then burnt out again which doesn't surprise me, um, but as you can see, there's something else that's visible here, and that is that, res that, capac uh, that transistor there has been swapped out, and if you look at the mess they've done of the traces, a lot of the traces have actually been lifted. Now, this is a dual-sided board. I'm not sure whether this thing had traces on the top side, but if it did, they're gone. So I'm going to have to remake some of the traces, which should be fun. There's another example, big mess down there. We don't know if the traces are intact or not. Can't really see. Look at those transistors over there. They're all removed. The traces on there have been ripped out. The ones in the middle are iffy at best. 
the end one you can't even see anymore. So again, not sure what's happening there. And here's an example where I've actually removed the transistors. These guys are, these traces have been basically ripped out. Um, now this happens quite easily. These boards aren't that old. I think they're uh, 94, 95 this thing was built, if I'm not mistaken. But the traces were, or rather the components were removed with excessive heat. So the traces, the actual pads, um, came unglued from the board and some of them probably got ripped out. So we don't really know what the status is anymore. This thing has to be checked, track per track, component per component. And you have to check for continuity. You can't just uh, do a visual check. And the reason I say this is what has to be done is because that's exactly what I did on the other side. This is now the other side, and these three transistors were bad. And I removed them, cleaned them up, and then soldered them in on the bottom end. And because there are tracks at the top, as you can see there, I had to check for continuity to each component point. And the only reason I was able to do this is that I actually do have the schematics for this, which is a miracle in itself. And before you ask, no, I can't actually publish them because they were given to me as a special favor. Um, and I gave them my word that I wouldn't publish the schematics. But I do have the schematics and I went point to point, literally. This thing took absolute ages. And I found three transistors gone, which were those three. And a resistor, which was, if I'm not mistaken, that one over there. Uh, the others are fine. I've tested all the transistors on this thing. Some of them I removed to test and basically to clean up some of the tracks. There wasn't as much damage on this side as there is on the other side. So that was a lot easier. But it was a hell of a job and I now have this side completely done. So I can actually test the output um, connecting it to the one side, but I'll show you a bit more of the others before I go and do that. Right, so this is the underside of the good side. As you can see, a hell of a lot of heat has been uh, put on that part of the board. Those transistors had been removed. These are the ones I swapped out. Miraculously, these connections are actually fine. I've checked them. But you can see the mess that was made on there. I've cleaned as much as I could, this half of the circuit. Now the other half of the circuit is a different story. This is a bloody nightmare. Tracks ripped out. Those are the three transistors that are removed. And look at this. Hell, look at that. This is what's happening underneath a row of those transistors. It is a total, total, total mess. It just gets worse. Look at this. Now somehow we're going to have to make some sense of all this. Some uh, broken tracks they've tried to repair there by connecting directly. I'm not sure if that's working or not. This is the bottom of those three transistors that I removed and tried to clean. This is going to be fun. A bit more solder porn. Bloody hell. Somebody tried to replace a track that had gone over there. The board is dirty. Some of these solder connections seem to be dry. That thing there looks very suspicious, that one over there. That looks like a dry solder joint. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to check all that as well. Bloody hell. Why do I get myself into this mess? Anyway, that's just to give you a bit of an overview of what this thing looks like. It is not pleasant. The good side doesn't look that hot, but it's functional, clean. This one looks like quite a challenge. And I think it's about time that I, I'm doing this on the 
20, when is it, 29th, 30th of December. And this is a good time to make a new New Year's resolution. Never attempt to repair stuff somebody else has been in. I uh, saw a video on one of the uh, channels that I subscribed to the other day where he actually said that that's what he does. If there's a piece of equipment that comes in and he sees somebody else has been in it, he refuses to do the repair. Now, he does this professionally. I do this as a hobby. So I guess if you do it as a hobby, um, these things are not problems, they're challenges. I have to keep reminding myself that that's what I'm looking at. Uh, challenges to make this more fun and uh, see if I can get to the end of this thing without uh, putting the rest of my hair out. Anyway, that's it for now. I'll keep at it and I'll keep reporting back and uh, see if we can... I'll decide at the end whether this video is actually worth publishing or not. So, <laughs> we I will see. You won't. You'll see it if it goes through. Right, I've got this ready to test the one channel. In this case, it's the left channel. And let me just run through very basically what the setup is. I've got a 1 kilohertz sine wave coming out of the uh, signal generator. It's at a very low level, 10 millivolts RMS. Now the reason for that is this thing has no volume control. So whatever you put on here, it amplifies full power, uh, which I think is 29 dB in this case. So if you happen to put in a big signal on there, you're gonna get a massive signal out when you switch this thing on. So we start very low and we basically then will increase this um, in steps to give us the level we want and we'll see that on the scope. Now the signal generator is single-ended and this thing uses a balanced input so I just happen to have an adapter here. It's taking the two signals and it's producing single-ended connection to the uh, balanced input. What it basically does is it uh, connects the minus prong of the, um, of the balanced plug to ground and we're only using the positive signal. That then goes into the input over here so we're not using the other side at all. Now I've got the input connected. I've also soldered the connection wires, the driving wires from this board to the output board and yes they've been checked these are correct. The drive minus is the white, the middle one is green which is the reference ground and then the drive plus is the brown and that's connected to the corresponding points on the other side. I then have two banana plugs um, connected to the speaker out and on this one here as you can see I've repaired that broken ground wire to the speaker so that's all set. And that then goes to my test box, which is a uh, switching between a dummy load and a speaker. At the moment, I've got it on speaker. Dummy load is set for 8 ohms when I want to switch that over, when we don't want to hear too much noise. So that's to the speaker output. And then that connection is being monitored on the scope as well. So I think we're about ready. Let me show you the power supply. I've got the amplifier off. And I've got this uh, connected, it's connected to the uh, limiter isolation transformer box that I've built. And I've got all the lamps on, so I've got minimum restriction. You'll see why in a minute. I'm going to put this on limit, and I'm going to put that on. So it's minimum restriction. We've got about 200 watts of light bulb on there. That should limit it to just under 1 amp if we have a short. Now we're just about ready and I'm going to leave this uh, camera aimed at the meter there so you can see what happens when we switch this on. Now bear in mind this thing is going to draw a hell of a lot of current when this thing first, uh, first goes on. So keep an eye on the light bulbs and see what happens. You'll actually see the thing trying to trip before it actually catches on. And I'll explain exactly what's happening. Right here we go. See that? We've heard the relay trip a few times when we put it on. It's drawing 350 milliamps and it's actually 
dropped the line voltage going in to 186 volts. And what we have here is now the possibility of my passing it, and we can do that because we don't seem to have a short. The light bulbs are fairly dim, but that's normal. So let's bypass the light bulbs. There we go. We've now got this thing pulling 223 volts. The supply is actually 230 volts, but um, this thing is drawing 570 milliamps, which is why the um, which is why the actual uh, line voltage has been dropped here. But we seem to have no shorts. This thing seems to be on. Now let's look at the scope when we power the input. Okay, I'm going to switch on the output of the signal generator. There we go. We can hear it and we can see it. Now at the moment we've got a very low signal, as I mentioned, 10 millivolts RMS coming in. This thing is showing us 270 millivolts RMS. If I increase, I'm going to double, let's just drop that, I'm going to double the input voltage to 20 millivolts, 30. Now, did you hear that? 20, or well, it's 10, 20, 30. That you've got to be very careful about. Let's put this on dummy load. And the reason you've got to be careful is if you've got this thing connected to speakers, like I had here, when the signal generator, which uh, at the moment I was basically using it as a volume control by increasing the uh, signal level, I'm effectively giving it more drive. And what happens with the signal generator, this particular one anyway, it's a Rigol DG1022, it actually has uh, various ranges and uh, it switches relays when it gets to the, the, the threshold of the range going on to the next one. And that's obviously happening between 20 millivolts and 30 millivolts. So when you switch the range, it actually sends a bit of a spike through. And if you're not careful, what you're going to get is this thing's going to amplify that spike and it could actually blow your speakers. But let me go back a little bit. We can see it working. Why did this thing basically start tripping like crazy and the light bulbs were showing shorts? When I switch this on, I'm actually powering both sides, although the power of the right channel is not going to the boards. But the supply is still supplying both sides. There are two transformers and two capacitor banks. Now these capacitors, I believe they add up to about 160,000 microfarads. And that draws a heck of a lot of current when you first switch this on. And what this thing has got, it's got a um, mains level detector with a relay protection on there. And if the mains uh, voltage goes below a certain amount, it actually trips and uh, lets you, well, lets you know that you've got a problem with your main supply. So what happens is when we switched on this thing with current limit, the surge of current coming in here dropped the main supply dramatically. And the relay detected that the voltage level, the mains level was too low, so it tripped off. But in the meantime, that surge of current did charge these capacitors a little bit. So when the relay chips back on, it charges a bit more, but it still detects that it's below the threshold. So it's switched off again, but these have now accumulated a bit more current. And successively, as this thing trips on and off, it starts charging the capacitor bank slowly. And I think it tripped about three or four times until it finally gets to the point where the mains voltage is not being dropped so much that the relay trips. And that's when it went on to that dim glow. So we know that this thing is not a short, it's actually just the amount of current surge that it's pulling in um, to charge the capacitor banks. So it's working perfectly. And the scope is still showing that sine wave very comfortably. At the moment it's about 800 millivolts RMS, so it's very low power. Let's have a look at uh, what happens when we increase that. As I said, I've got the thing on dummy load. It's, two, it's a resistor inside. It's uh, actually, I believe they are 100 watts each. It's on 8 ohm, so we've actually got uh, the 4 ohm resistors, or is it 8 in parallel? I'm not sure. But anyway, I don't want to go too far up uh, the power rating because I don't want to blow those resistors. It can take quite a bit of beating, but not that much. So we'll increase the input and see what happens to the sine wave. Let's drop that down. 
Now I'm going to take it up to, that's 100 millivolts input. We've got 2.7 coming out there. Still a perfect sine wave. Drop that again. There's 200 millivolts input. We've got 5.4, 5.5 volts output. Let me go up to 300 millivolts input. 8 point something, 4. Now this thing is drawing more current as we go up, but it's still showing a perfect sine wave. I have 500 millivolts RMS input at the moment. I'm not going to go too far beyond that because I don't want to fry the resistors, so let me drop that down to 100. But as you can see, we've got a perfect sine wave over there. This thing is stable. Bear in mind that if I had a balanced um, input, not single-ended as I've connected it here, this would be double the voltage. And what we see here is that the one channel is working perfectly. So this part of the driver board, this input board, is working perfectly, as is that channel of the power amplifier. And so I'm a happy guy. Now, the challenge is going to be the other channel. And as I mentioned, that one is the one that uh, had taken quite a beating. I'm not sure how much of it is blown. I'm not sure just how easy it's going to be to remake or rebuild those tracks that are blown out. I'd like to do it very carefully and, uh, and properly so we get a final result that's uh, going to last a long, long time. And so, for now, I'm going to close this video and um, when I have the other channel done, or when I have any issues with the other channel, I'll report back with a part two, maybe even a part three of this series. But um, this, uh, I just wanted to show you. There's one thing I want to mention as well. There are various adjustments on here. Uh, for example, you do have a DC driver, DC servo on here. And there's a measurement where you measure the voltage between the ground pin and pin 2, and you adjust that to 0 millivolts, uh, plus minus 2 millivolts with that pot. There's an adjustment between 1 and 3, and you adjust it with that pot. There's also a DC offset, which adjusts with that pot. You measure the output uh, DC offset. At the moment, I've, I've done the adjustments. There's 0 volts on there. And there's also a bias uh, adjustment, which you're supposed to set the two test points, and you're supposed to set them for a particular voltage across those sense resistors. Uh, it's 15 millivolts, I believe. I've adjusted that. It was incredibly high. Um, let me show you where that is. Those two prongs sticking out there are actually the test points. And you put a multimeter across there, and then you adjust that pot over there, that uh, trimmer pot, it's a 10 turn pot, till you get 15 millivolts across those two points over there. Now what you're measuring here is actually the current between one pair of transistors, the bias current between one pair of transistors, emitter to emitter. And 15 millivolts, it goes across, uh, I believe it's 0.33 or 0.3 ohm resistors, 2.15s in series. So you get about 50 millivolts drive, fixed drive, and that's what you need for this thing. Now, this thing was reading about 60 or 70 millivolts. So the amount of drive current going through there was incredibly high. And it's surprising that the transistors have actually withstood that. Now they, they're pretty well heat sinked as you can tell. This thing is quite hefty and they seem to hold on well enough but um, definitely not a good thing to do overdriving it like that and again I was doing this on one channel so I can imagine what it was doing to the power. The actual power consumption there which at the moment is 0.45 amps and it's driving that signal uh, what is it driving it at? 2.7 volts. So that uh, current is less than half an amp. It was somewhere in the region of 1.2 amps when I first turned it on. 
without adjusting before adjusting that bias uh, pot. So this thing was getting seriously, seriously overdriven. But anyway, I'm happy for now and I hope to report back soon with the twin brother and then get this whole thing tested and cleaned up properly before giving it back to the guy. Right, thanks for watching. See you soon.